Digital life. We're always connected and always on. We have the information at our fingertips to make decisions anytime, anywhere. Digital work? Not so much. Let's take a look at the marine industry. We have visibility when we have proximity. We make critical decisions based on gauges and gut feel, which means our decisions can be subjective. Such a decision process can lead to inconsistent performance, reduced monetization, and a poor return on assets. Many industries have embraced digital to future-proof their business. Think about trains and planes. Data jumpstarts the journey to intelligent insights, to remote operations, to autonomous control. What about the marine industry? It's disrupted by margin pressures, oversupply and growing regulations. Digital unlocks the fastest transformation to future-proof marine operations. GE is pioneering this transformation through an innovative mix of digital and industrial solutions for rapid evolution from gauges and gut feel to data-driven decisions to D-man to no man operations. GE's vessel wide asset performance management enables a shift to data driven decisions. This means reduced unplanned downtime, maintenance costs, and energy spend, all aggregating to reduced OPEX. Laying the groundwork to D man, moving shared expertise on shore, and optimizing fleet wide resources. And through GE's new generation of controls and automation, smart, autonomous operations will soon be a reality. These are GE solutions for rapid, pragmatic evolution. Partner with GE to begin digitally transforming your industrial enterprise and future-proof your business. Great, well thank you everybody. Um, really appreciate all of you being here with us today. Um, really excited to be talking about uh, this topic on where things are going in the marine space. I have a uh, real passion for things that move. So be it electrons, as you heard me talk about earlier, earlier. today, yeah. um, or uh, I've had the opp opportunity now to be around uh, jet engines, mining vehicles, locomotives, and, and marine vessels. And so um, Noble's been an amazing partner of ours. Bernie's been really leading the organization through um, just a really fascinating transformation, embracing digital to improve the operational excellence of the organization. Bernie's responsible for increasing um, Noble's capabilities, advancing the company culture of, as I said, both through safety and operational excellence. He initially joined Noble um, through the Transworld acquisition um, in 1991, and it's held the division manager position at the company's Middle East and Brazil divisions. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of what Bernie is doing is really focusing on how to improve operational excellence. And I believe, Bernie, you have a, a video to share around kind of how Noble's thinking about it and how you're driving this effort. Sure. Thanks for the introduction, Russell. Um, you know, it's my pleasure to be here today to talk a little bit about Noble's digital roadmap and how we think that, um, um, fully expect that adopting a digital approach to our running our business will allow us to continue on this performance improvement journey as well as reduce our costs. So it's a really critical phase for our business. To lay the groundwork on where we are today, in 2010 we adopted a transformational move from shallow and mid-water drilling focused company to a deep water and ultra deep water performance focused company. And that drive was um, pursued through a relentless um, commitment to operational excellence. And so this brief video kind of introduces what we've done to date. It kind of sets the stage for where we are and, and then we're gonna, how we're going to leapfrog on top of that to Sounds the next good. level. So. Operations excellence is managing operational risk and ensuring operational integrity with continuous improvement. 
Together, our management system, marine maintenance and subsea teams provide the tools and support for Noble's operational excellence. This begins with our employees worldwide having the knowledge, skills, and tools needed to establish and maintain high operational standards. To achieve high standards of reliability and performance, our integrated management system connects every employee with the policies, procedures, and practices we use to deliver consistent results. The Marine Department brings focus to marine safety by developing and establishing corporate marine standards, assists in the planning and execution of rig moves, and drives continuous improvement through targeted internal and external marine audits. Specialists are continuously deployed to help with a range of issues including performing rig down troubleshooting, addressing equipment performance issues, ensuring critical spares are available, and planning and executing maintenance. Well control is first and foremost a matter of process safety and critical to the integrity of our operations. Well integrity is maintained through employees being vigilant and trained in drilling and well control procedures. The last line of defense for well control is our equipment. Our subsea experts have developed rigorous inspection, testing and maintenance processes for this equipment, as well as training programs for those who operate and maintain the equipment. By maintaining marine integrity, equipment reliability and well integrity, we set the stage for delivering high performance drilling operations. Operations excellence is the noble way. So you know, in pursuing this operational excellence, um, we learned many things. One of the things we learned is that many times we introduce failures through maintenance, mm -hmm. doing maintenance that has no benefit. In fact, creating you know man-made problems yeah. through lack of um, perfection in, in the process. So we hope that um, what we're adopting now will actually eliminate some of this maintenance that's unneeded and provides no benefit and allow us to take it sort of to the next level. Yeah. You know, I have uh, had the opportunity to really write, kind of grow up in GE through the operating, different operating functions. And so I have a great deal of respect for the importance of just sheer operating discipline. And the journey that you're laying out here is quite fascinating. Let's talk about some of the megatrends behind it or some of the microtrends that you're dealing with um, as well that, that kind of said this is what you need to be focused on. So could you share a little bit around uh, the dynamic around low oil prices, aging workforce, how is that affecting the way you do business today? Well, I mean, I, I don't really need to explain to this crowd margin pressure. Uh, margins are under huge pressure. Um, we have transitioned from a period when a client just needed a rig to where a client demands performance and requires you to be able to demonstrate that capability before you get the job. And, but we're still stuck in a world of kind of ad hoc performance measurement. We measure a little while, we focus on something else, we measure something else, we come back. It, it's not consistent at all. Um, the workforce is generally ready for the change, to be honest, because um, during the great growth periods from the 2012, 2015, um, we brought in a lot of new people. And, and so the workforce is fundamentally ready for some change, not to say that there's not a lot of cultural challenges associated with it, but uh, it, it's less about aging workforce and it's more about you know, how we're gonna manage the cultural challenges of that workforce. Um, you know, in terms of reducing costs, what we're looking for is how do we reduce costs structurally? I mean, we all know that everybody lowers the cost to gain market share, particularly in a down market, but how do we retain some of that advantage if and when the oil price improves? And if it doesn't improve, then how do we use that advantage to survive, you know, and so what we're looking for is a means by which to kind of institutionalize those savings mm -hmm. and, and eliminate um, costs from our supply chain um, kind of from top to bottom. So you, you hit on the supply chain. I mean, that's one of the places when you're in a tough, tight market that you start to see disruption or changes to the things work. Do you think you're going to see significant disruption in the supply chain? Uh, Certainly, I believe so. For us, it's a huge opportunity around inventory that we carry on these assets. You know, it's trapped, trapped money that doesn't make its way to the bottom line. It often um, expires on the shelf, to be honest with you. And, you know, we, we've taken the steps to adjust max mins based on historical usage levels. But by adopting a, the digital twins, we should be able to actually predict when we're going to need to do the maintenance and work on 
I won't say just in time inventory because of our logistics situations don't really support that, but certainly drive our in stock inventories down. And also be able to have a little more insight into, you know, what is it about this component that um, is not lasting? Why isn't it lasting? What, we, what can we do about it to, to put some pressure on our supply chain to deliver better components as well? You know, during some of these, you find that um, sometimes customers kind of go just back to basics, brute force, operationally, but you're embracing digital. I mean, we've heard a lot of people today talk about why they saw the benefits. What do you think is the benefit of digital helping you get to this in the fastest way possible? Well, the oil field has been, you know, it, it attracts the brute force method for sure. And so uh, there's a lot of nostalgia and culture around that, but you know, the, our business, particularly deep water, has had to move on. Um, you know, post Macondo, there's just not an acceptance for that um, approach to doing mm -hmm. business. So the real opportunities is that, you know, we look around and we have all these, what I call data islands, and we're, we're utilizing them very poorly, and we have no access to the data that's flowing through the networks on our rigs day in and day out, 24 hours a day. And so your product is basically allowing us to surface that in a OEM agnostic way so that we can then act on that data. And, and we just feel like that it's part of changing our culture to one where decisions are more founded on good data versus you know the gut feel, which is um, very much the way of today, to be honest. Talk a little bit more, I mean, you know, you come to events like this and you want to kind of make sure you're not just listening to somebody tell you the what, right? I mean, so understanding the how is really right. the takeaway for the audience. I mean, okay. this journey that you're on here, kind of talk through, so on data-driven decisions, I know you're um, using the CC Insight solution, the APM solution. Talk about what outcomes specifically are you looking for out of that as you made that decision? Yeah, I mean, specific outcomes we're, we're looking at is that, you know, A, most of our maintenance today is on a calendar-based schedule or an engine hours or some other form of tracking service life. And so we're, we're doing a lot of maintenance based on this calendar, whether we've fully utilized that piece of equipment during this calendar period or not, with no real post-mortem follow-up, was that maintenance of any benefit? So one thing we're looking to do is just eliminate a lot of calendar-based maintenance. Secondly, we're looking to measure if the maintenance actually de delivered any benefit. You know, post-changing filters, oil, et cetera, on a top drive gearbox, did the oil temperature come down? Did the oil pressure go up? Did we, did we see any measurable improvement? Did the oil analysis indicate we even needed to do that work? So that's one, one part of what we hope to achieve. The other is strictly predictive alerting. I mean, quite often the downtime you have is also at the worst time you could possibly have it. So for us, if you're drilling at 25,000 feet and 8,000 feet of water, and you have a downtime event, you often have to secure the well. And securing the well basically adds 10 days to whatever period of time you need to actually make that repair. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from an economic point of view, if you can predict a future failure in any, any way and deal with it during a uh, non-critical time frame, you eliminate you know, a lot of downtime, and improve the revenue capture greatly. So you have real clarity around the outcomes you're looking for, alerts to help you monitor those outcomes. What did you see in C-Stream Insight from a component standpoint that made you feel good that it was a solution that could help you get the outcomes? Yeah, I mean, maybe getting in the weeds, but one, I was pretty impressed by your programmers and their ability to sort of like translate the uh, layman's view of what I want to see, what I care about into a graphic in, in a very short time frame. I, I'm used to, you know, that interaction with IT being a bit laborious and you got to write your use case and expected benefits. And these guys are kind of working almost real time with us. Um, you've got a team in our office. They're there, you know, five days a week, every week, working with our maintenance team and our IT group to make sure that um, we're progressing. Um, and then, you know, I, I think the way you approach the problem in the first place where we had to both kind of trust each other. Um, you know, we have a gain share arrangement, yep. you know. You benefit as we benefit and you suffer as we suffer. And so we were able to negotiate that very transparently. And 
we knew we didn't even have the KPI we were going to measure against when we started the negotiations, yet we were able to get through the negotiations on a basis of trust, knowing that we'll get there. So I think that was one really big part of it. Yeah, so you say something pretty important, this idea of trust between the two organizations, but inside of your organization, there's also a cultural transformation that has to happen for this to take hold, right? So sure. people, processes, how, how have you managed the cultural aspect? Well, uh, you know, we're only starting that journey. I mean, you know, the culture change, uh, fear, habit, and um, lack of information are or, or or big barriers. And so um, one of the key um, approaches we're going to take is uh, to be inclusive and to share small successes, small wins, um, opportunities to educate a broader part of the fleet about what's going on, even though they're not directly participating in this. Um, you know, in the initial stages, um, it's all about having better time on wrench, less time doing wrench, less wrench time doing things that don't produce any good results. And generally speaking, we have a lot of people in the field that already know that doing this task adds no real benefit from their gut. Mm -hmm. But now we're transforming that into data-driven information. So if we can help communicate that to them, share that information, educate them along the way, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a challenge. But at the end of the day, um, it has to start with communication, you know, yeah. and shared experience. You know, sometimes you get these benefits and it's almost like trying to flow it through a pipe where unless it's open throughout the, uh, kind of through the system, you don't get the full benefit of it. So you're obviously focused on operational excellence, but you can't have the rest of the organization just looking and watching this play out, right? So what are you doing about enterprise excellence? How do you make sure marketing, finance, you know, the rest of the organization understands how to monetize and take advantage of what you're seeing? Right. Well, for one is, just a quick comment, this is an operations focused project. Mm -hmm. So it's not an IT project. We have a great IT department, but it's not an IT project. Yep. It's operations. And because operations is what we do, Noble is kind of historically aligned with supporting operations. But as you mentioned, the enterprise from supply chain to HR to learning and development, um, accounting and finance, all those groups we had to bring with us. Now marketing and contracts is ready for the journey. Because you know the opportunity for those guys to go into a client with an iPhone app and show them how we're performing in real time answers a whole lot of questions about your culture, yeah. about what your company brings to the table when you deliver a rig and people. You know, so uh, marketing's ready for the journey. They don't fully understand, you know, how best to utilize it. But but it's it's like every other part of iPhone adoption, if you will, or Android, whatever. I mean put it in their hands, people figure out how to make the best use of it. So we won't have the challenge there. I think supply chain is gonna take a lot of work um, because you have to do a lot of work to really define what are the values you wanna extract from your supply chain mm -hmm. and how best to do them. And, and we've worked really hard to reduce our dependence on third party technical support in the field and to bring it on shore via cameras and real time data. And so uh, some of that low-hanging fruit we've already captured. But in the supply chain, particularly in, in the parts, OEM, and turn times on, on repairs, if we can capture some of that, that, that's probably one of the single biggest pieces of this. Um, so you started moving kind of up the curve there in your answer. So, you know, today, if we kind of look at the, the trajectory here, your gauges are things that typically, you're right in front of them where the action happens. But now with the capabilities that you're picking up, you're able to do that further away, so not, you know, not having to be within proximity of the devices and monitoring more remotely. Right. Uh, how are you seeing that progress? What types of benefits are you seeing from that in accomplishing your objectives? Yeah, so, I mean, we're early on that path, um, but, you know, we very routinely now um, can save, you know, 24 to 48 hours on um, equipment down events, mm -hmm. strictly by remoting in third-party expertise. Um, the gap that, we hope uh, the C-Stream Insights will, will fill for us is the gap where we have a problem on a rig or an impending problem and we basically spend six hours troubleshooting it with kind of a gut feel, parts change approach. Mm -hmm. We want to get away from that. We want to bring the problem to shore within the first hour and then we want to accelerate that troubleshooting phase and eliminate that, you know, often the troubleshooting takes exactly as much time as a repair. And so we can squeeze that out of the system and get straight to the problem. We'll save a lot of time there. So that we're, 
that is actually one of the very first deliverables we, we hope to have out of this. Um, also our data room, if you will, is, is not isolated, it's not somewhere else. It, it's, it's on the one floor where operations lives, you know, and so it's right in the middle of all that and, and we, we, we intend to make it a hub and kind of drive, you know, some adoption simply from familiarity and, and, and physical closeness, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the data stream, we're, we're attacking seven major systems right now with our, with our first rollout, but that could easily be tripled, you know, and so um, walk before you run. We're doing that now, um, but as soon as we have the, these first streams of data, we actually have it coming to shore now for one rig and expect all four by the end of December. But as soon as we have that, and as soon as we get all the um, uh, digital twins up and running, we're, we're not gonna rest on our laurels. We're gonna go look for what is that next piece of equipment we can bring to shore. Um, we've got a lot of great export, experts offshore, but they spend a lot of time being available in case there's a problem. That's not efficient use of resources. Yeah. You know, we want those resources on shore so that we can deploy them between rigs during critical periods and make better use of their skill sets and not just have them there in case, you know. So you just hit on our, another real benefit, this, especially with the workforce dynamic, to be able to centralize experts versus having to have them deployed offshore. How are you thinking about that? I mean, is it changing kind of the talent management strategies or, you know, how are you navigating through that? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's where we'll obviously come against our first real cultural challenges. You know, I mean, we, we have several people on board, a big DP drill ship today who watch consoles. And, you know, 80% of console watching doesn't need to be done offshore. So how do you address bridge management, engine control room management, um, subsea systems management, how do you address some part of it remotely? How do you multi-skill people on board the rig so that what used to be a full-time job is now a 20% of the time job? And then how do you achieve all that and comply with regulations that maybe aren't as moving as fast as we are? So, you know, there are opportunities to demand. They're very clear, you know. Um, there's, there's a half dozen positions on a rig that, it, that are assistant whatever assistant DPO, assistant sub C, assistant mechanic ET. Um, a lot of those guys are there as a security blanket, you know, and they're rarely fully engaged. When they are fully engaged, they're often doing maintenance that we don't know if it brings any value. So as we start to understand which part of the maintenance really adds value, we can start to identify opportunities for demanding as well. That's great. So I'm gonna ask a couple more questions and then wanna make sure we open it up for people in the room to ask questions. So the path that you've been on to date, um, especially as you start to look at the last part of the journey here of Nomad, how have those components built up to your view of how you would implement kind of a Nomad strategy, if you will? Yeah, so you know, I'm too old to, to imagine the future right now where we have a true Nomad drilling operation, mm -hmm. but I can tell you the areas we're working on. We're working on automated tripping, um, elimination of exposure to drops hazard on the rig floor mm -hmm. for what we call a floor hand. And just those two alone would reduce the potential for fatality on the rig by probably 60%. Hmm. It's not a high risk today, but it is a risk. And if we could make dramatic inroads on that, I mean, so it's about taking the machines we already have, connecting them together so that they work in an autonomous way. They don't do that now. They're all individual machines and they're not talking to each other. Um, so we're working um, with a pilot right now to start auto tripping on one of our rigs um, in December. So the, you know, the vision is that with auto tripping, you reduce exposure of the people on the floor to the drops hazards and mm -hmm. the finger injuries and so forth. So that's just one step in the curve. And then you know, the next step is, is thinking more broadly and in the future is where does the driller really need to be? How close to the rig floor does he need to be to run the operation? Yeah. You know, and it, it's a big step change and it's easy to kind of poo-poo the idea and throw out all the reasons why you can't do it. And I'm, I'm right there with them. I can help <laughs> with that list. But um, you have to address the potential, you know, and that's what we're looking to do. 
So you talked about a couple of the challenges of getting there. Are there other structural, other big hurdles along the way to Nomad that you are worried about? Um, one of the big hurdles is that the uh, drilling equipment business runs in very discrete generational versions, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's no 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, then you jump to version seven. It's version six, wholesale change out version seven. That is a challenge. You know, that is a challenge to automation and, and demanding the rig because we have to work with the OEM vendors who write the software and who develop the systems and push, cajole, encourage, make them part of the journey if we really want to be successful in that next stage. So that, that's a clear hurdle. Um, the er, uh, other hurdle is just, you know, in these hard times, um, people tend to retrench to what got you here in the first place, you know, and that, uh, in this case, um, seems more like a survival tactic than a long-term strategy, and we're, we're, we're trying to defend, you know, against that. Yeah. When you add these capabilities, you know, other spaces as well, you start to hear new models that people start to deploy. I mean, do you see, once you get to Nomad, a different way to utilize assets? Is there an Uberization um, type right. of thing that can happen in this space? You know, I mean, there certainly is a potential for that. I, I won't say Uberization as, as that model, but the concept of that model, I mean, what, what you have happening today, literally, is you have um, some of our competitors going through Chapter 11 reorganizations, mm -hmm. completely destroy their workforce, destroy their equity, and reemerge ready to go back to work with a bunch of stacked assets and no crew, no history, starting not from scratch, but certainly from a very low spot. You know, does every company need to have all these systems, or is there an opportunity to, to manage those assets with a few companies that are really extremely good at it and have the systems to rapidly take on a new challenge, adopt these technologies into running those assets, mm -hmm. and bring them online in a way that's better for the asset owner and better for the client. You know, so th I think there are opportunities for a uh, not unlike Uber yeah. approach to it, for sure. Great. So let's open it up to the uh, audience and see if we have questions. Yes. Sure, and there are probably people in GE in the room better placed to answer the question, but there, there's two components to that. One is, is that we, we brought all the historians on shore, so we've, the digital twins are built off the historians without any bandwidth challenges. Um, the other part is the updates are not sent as in, I need to send you all my information Instead, the information is sent based on what has changed since the last time I sent you the information. So we're parsing a lot of the information on the rig so that we don't over and repeat sending. We are bringing it to servers in town. Um, the other thing is that MRSAT space has become very, very competitive. You know, so we're looking at opportunities now to kind of triple our bandwidth for less than we're currently paying by adopting some new technologies and um, opening it up to more like a um, shared plan that you have with your cell phone. So um, at this stage, you know, looking at the bandwidth demand we expect to have, we don't, we don't expect any incremental cost in, in bandwidth. Yes. Okay, um, development timeline, Jason help me if I'm wrong, but I think we signed the agreement in December of last year or thereabouts. Um, we went through a planning phase which kind of took us through about the first quarter of this year and then that shifted to working with the OEMs to identify all the data tags 
nomenclature and which data tags were actually the real data versus some combination of data into some calculated measurement. Um, so we anticipated that was going to be a, a real challenge um, because it's not only new for us, it's new for a lot of our OEMs and there's a protected fence around the garden. Uh, for all but one vendor, uh, which was not even the one I was most worried about, uh, that didn't materialize. And so we were able to, to make those conversations happen. And uh, the guys did a great job in, you know, in explaining why we're doing what we're doing. And we never had a challenge on data ownership. So you know, here we are today. It's um, October. We've got data flowing from one rig. Um, by the second week of November, we'll have data from three, and by the end of December, data from four. The digital twins are being built in parallel based on the historian data, so they're moving in sync with our, what we call our data mile. And then the KPI, which is your second question, is, is moving slightly behind that. So from the KPIs, our initial focus is on the KPIs that are most relevant to our customers. You know, so if you look at a pie chart of a typical deep water well, um, the time you spend drilling almost exactly matches the time you spend tripping pop. In fact, tripping usually wins by a couple of percent. So if you drill on an average well 17% of the time, you're probably gonna trip 22% of the time. So the very first place we're going is tripping speeds. And so with this uh, C-Stream Insights data source, um, the typical measurement in the oil field is you know slip to slip, or mud pump to mud pump, mud pumps off to mud pumps back on and drilling. Um, well, the data set we have allows us to measure every incremental step in that two or three minute or seven minute period. So we not only know how long it takes slip to slip, how long did it take to get the pumps ramped down, how long did it take to get the weight on the slips, how long did it take the iron roughneck to advance out to well center, how long did it take the claws to close and come up to pressure? So we've got that insight into all that detail so that we can then start working with the manufacturer, the assistant driller who's running that equipment, and the driller who's trying to coordinate all this in a, in a more systematic way you know, to drive those KPIs. So we're gonna focus on KPIs that the client care about the most right now. Typically the client is paying some third party to gather KPIs by analyzing mud logger data and daily report data with a human in the middle and you get the report the next morning between 4 and 6 a.m. We want these KPIs to be real time on the rig and basically have a screen about this size in a room so that they can visually see during the early stages of a trip how they're performing. So before the trip is over and you declare that a slow trip, we can say, are we going to do something about this trip so that this doesn't become the slow trip, you know? And so, yeah, Obviously, safety is a concern, um, but you know, there's a concept I'm very unfamiliar with called gamification, and so we want to engage our drillers and assistant drillers and rig managers around the concept that you know, this is a performance opportunity for you. We're not gonna try to drive you to outperform what you can safely do, but here's your measurement, here's how you're doing, here's your score, you're in the game, drive your score up, you know, and that's a cultural challenge, but that, that's where we're headed with that. GE, uh, thank you very much for some good insights as well as uh, what is obviously a very good collaboration. I have a question. Uh, as you use uh, data analytics and now building digital twins uh, for many of these assets, is there an opportunity around, uh, for yourself or for your clients, around um, insurance, whether it's equipment breakdown or business interruption or safety related? Um, you know, we. We generally don't insure for, for equipment breakdown, if I understand the question right. We occasionally insure for loss of hire, but that's usually more related to tropical storm activity and it's very limited. I, th I think the real opportunity is that, you know, in this market, um, the discussions with clients about indemnities, downtime, allowable time for maintenance, their understanding of our needs has evaporated, you know. I mean, they're not understanding of what we need so what we have to do is figure out how to accomplish this maintenance on the margins, how to reduce downtime without them paying us 24 or 48 hours of free downtime per month, um, because you know the power has shifted 100% to the client right now due to oversupply in the market. So it's not that we're not gonna accept their terms. I mean, we're not gonna accept company killers, but we are gonna accept 
very challenging downtime and performance terms. And so this data gives us the opportunity to kind of achieve or minimize the impact, you know, of those terms we accept. Uh, thank you very much for a good insight. Morten Hansen from SAS Networks, so a satellite operator. So uh, the drilling industry has been known for being a steel and people in historically, and, and you've left a lot of, um, of the, the intelligence and all that to the NOVs, Hoisman and all that. It's been on that side, IT has been on the other side. How do you see the cultural transformation right now where you, as the head of the operation, takes the ownership on that digital side of it? Is, is how, what's the big challenge you're standing in front of with regards to owning that as a company and set aside from the rest of the industry? You know, it, it's going to be an interesting trip with the vendors, with the OEMs, you know, the Houseman, the NOVs, and, and Acker, MH Worth, all those guys. I mean, it's going to be an interesting journey because historically, they have not shared that information with us that we now have direct access to. And so now we have more insight into how their equipment is performing than they actually have because they see it in the break fix mode usually, not in the real time mode. And so we are very likely to become the experts on the design issues and challenges they face in terms of uh, service life. But I think you know, the right behavior on our part is to bring them into our data. Let them become a part of this because we absolutely need them engaged to improve our performance, you know, and so I, we never intend to be an OEM. We don't want to, you know, manufacture parts. We need the Hausmans, the NOVs of the world, you know, in our office and interested and part of the solution um, longer term. It, it's going to be a challenge, particularly around the subsea BOP assets where, you know, a lot of what we do is sort of um, protectionist, you know, it, it, we're probably over maintaining some things, under maintaining some things, but we don't know why and how and by how much because there's not a lot of good data. So it's gonna be a journey that exposes, you know, some liability concerns, um, proprietary information kind of concerns, and uh, we're just gonna to have to work through that, you know, but uh, we're gonna to try to do it with, hey, come to the office, join us. I mean, and, and we don't plan to deliver this or GE's not delivering this as a, it's only in this room asset. You know, it's, it's an asset you can approach through the web. So if we need someone from an OEM engaged in real time, we can share the insights we're getting from our digital twins in real time with those guys and, and leverage their expertise as well. I hope I answered your question. If not, let me know. Just a, yes, a small follow-up on it, because some of that is moving in, so if some of the drilling companies are looking at doing things more internally themselves and establishing a CTO role, taking the, the OT and, and IT together, while some are more saying, okay, let's leave someone else to that and, and partner up and, and bring in like GE here to, to bring in uh, cross-industry knowledge in there. So, so there's a, a change where people are looking, what's the strategy? And, and how does right. Noble look at that one from a strategy? Our strategy from a service perspective has been to bring expertise in-house. Um, that's been a strategy we embarked on in probably 2011, 2012. Um, you know, we found, uh, just to throw a number out, in the early days of these rigs, we were spending three million a year on service techs on board the rigs. And, you know, by bringing that expertise in-house, not bringing, but developing that expertise in-house from the ground up, you know, we've dropped those costs down to like 800,000 or something like that. And so that's still big money, there's still opportunity, but the strategy we're embarked upon is to have the expertise in-house to assess the problems, to be the best at understanding what those problems are, while still being 100% dependent on the OEM to provide the code tweaks, the um, quality assurance and the things they have to do so that we're not crossing that barrier where we're taking ownership of how that equipment actually physically operates. We're not touching their software. We're not in there to change their parameters. We want them to change them on the basis of our input. I think uh, we're out of time because uh, the next session is going to start. Oh, can we take one more? Or oh, that's yeah. it. One last Just question. one last question. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Yes, my question is related of the lead time between uh, uh, when uh, you are requested to your warehouse or, or provider up to the uh, rig, okay? Is this tool allows you to reduce the lead time 
because it's cost. And it's a matter of cost, okay? Right. How this tool will allow you and your, and your teams to reduce the lead time with this productivity tool? That's my question, please. Okay. So the, you know, the supply chain lead time for a low cost delivery on logistics of a piece of part ranges from as little as two weeks to 120 days, depending on where you're at in the world, what customs regimes you have to deal with, and what shipping challenges you may have to get there. So there is a long delivery cycle. The average is probably 60 days, if you take the global fleet. Now, so we've based all our current inventories on the knowledge that we have these average lead times for all these different regions, so we factor that into our max mins on board the rig. But what's not factored into the max min is, right now we're just saying we have this maintenance coming up, so we need these parts, and we have the risk of a failure, so we need these parts. So if we start to reduce the risk of failure, and we start to predict the maintenance that's coming up, then we're gonna go after what is it we really need to keep on the shelves? And can we share it between assets within the region? And can we base that decision on information? Right now, everybody's reluctant to reduce parts on shelf because we don't have the information that allows us to make a decent decision. It's all gut feel because I feel better having it. And right, you know, with today's day rates, uh, we, we can no longer afford to be so conservative in that regard. You're welcome. Well, Bernie, thank you so much for being here with us today and really thank appreciate you. your uh, your trust in us as a partner. And we look forward to continuing with you on this journey to operational excellence with Noble. Thank, thank you. Thank awesome. you. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Partner with GE and transform into data-rich, decision-rich enterprises.